to go ahead and get started. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Michael Chaitin. Uh, he's a scientist at the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit and he's an assistant professor at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Uh, he has a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Toronto and has been an active um, researcher in tobacco control since uh, 2000 when he started working for Physicians for a Smoke-Free Canada and the International Non-Governmental Coalition Against Tobacco. His own work is, uh, involves understanding the impact of policy on smoking cessation and the development of tobacco-related um, comorbidities. And uh, he's here today uh, through a, a, a nice connection, which we had read an article, maybe it was by your group, uh, yes, so about the uh, new cigarettes that the tobacco companies have introduced following the uh, ban on menthol cigarettes in Ontario. And so we had uh, reached out to our uh, compatriot in Toronto, Tony George, about maybe getting some of those cigarettes so we could see what's in them. And uh, through that we made connections and uh, learned that there's a study going on uh, in Ontario in collaboration with the VCU uh, T cores, but also the FDA was quite interested. And maybe we started this discussion first, where they're going to be uh, following up a thousand menthol smokers following the ban. So we thought it would be great to uh, uh, institute a collaboration where we can perhaps involve our biochemistry or our, our chemistry work with the kind of work you're doing and looking at the packaging and the cigarettes themselves. And so Michael's down here today to tell us about that project and then to have a chance to talk with people about collaborations and, and how to move forward. So please welcome Michael here today. Thank you uh, so much and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I, it was a, a really fortuitous um, event of, of where finding that connection where you, where you were looking for the, the, the cigarettes ourselves and we had the cigarettes but we were just looking for the packaging so um, it was a, a really uh, a, 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 the way science should work I think is the, the story. So I'll be talking today uh, about um, our preliminary results on this evaluation of Ontario's um, a menthol ban. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge uh, collaborators, um, Tom Eisenberg, uh, Joanna Cohen, uh, Eric Soule at BCU, and uh, Rob Schwartz, also at University of Toronto, uh, the staff, and of course the funding from um, NIH. So a number of jurisdictions have now started thinking about banning menthol on cigarettes or have started to, to ban menthol from, uh, from cigarettes and other tobacco products. Uh, this particular ban was uh, announced in uh, 2015, just on the heels of a, 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 a couple of other provinces in Ontario, Alberta and Nova Scotia, who were first, and uh, Ontario announced uh, 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 wanting to make sure that they weren't left behind um, from this wave of flavor bans. And it, this, the legislation itself really evolved out of um, earlier flavor legislation that was implemented in 2009 uh, banning flavors from uh, small cigars under 1.4 grams in Ontario and Canada. Um, and uh, there were concerns about that ban uh, being too limited. Uh, certainly, the, you know, one of the tobacco companies' response was that they just made all of the cigars 1.45 grams and suddenly they were allowed to flavor again. Uh, so the, the main intent of the, the, this menthol law was actually to address that loophole. And in 2016, uh, uh, most flavors were removed from those metal-sized cigars, as well as smokeless products and, and uh, hookah. Um, and the, the, but the menthol ban was delayed for an, an additional year. And the good thing about that delay was that it allowed us to be able to put in place a proper evaluation that we weren't able to do in Alberta or Nova Scotia. The design of, of this evaluation, I'm not going to focus on very much, but essentially had three components. One, uh, a, a, a random, simple random sample by telephone of smokers in Ontario. 
Um, we then took the menthol smokers that we found from that sample and added uh, another 700 from uh, a smoker's registry that we have um, and followed that group, or uh, following that group longitudinally, uh, measured their behaviors just before the ban, uh, this, this current results from just after the ban, and we're continuing to follow them up for another year. We've also conducted a before and after uh, pack purchase study, which we'll see some preliminary results. It's important, I think, to, to understand the context of Ontario, that it is a, a bit of a different jurisdiction. It's a, Canada's largest uh, province of about 12 million people um, and, uh, and has considered itself to be on the forefront of tobacco control measures generally. Uh, one of the, the sort of the key contextual pieces is that we do have a display ban. So uh, when you go into a store, you don't see tobacco on shelves. They have to be behind uh, doors or under, um, uh, under the counter. And the uh, store owners can't even lift up these shelves to be able to, so people can scan. So essentially what that means is when you go to ask for a tobacco, you have to know what you're asking for first. And that makes um, switching a, a little bit harder than in other jurisdictions. Similarly, the packs themselves don't have a lot of advertising space. So this is an example of a, um, this is in fact a, a menthol cigarette. And uh, <laughs> so, so this, is, this is what pack, packs looks like. So the actual, um, uh, let's call it advertising space for the tobacco company is just a small strip on the front and the back, uh, the sides. Uh, there's also, um, uh, a health insert on the inside, but there are uh, the tobacco companies have used the inside of the tobacco of the tobacco package as well. Um, it's also important to note that that the Ontario uh, that the Canadian cigarettes are actually quite different, or may, not different, but more limited than uh, than those smoked in the U.S. And, and much of the world. That we don't really smoke burly blend tobaccos. So. Uh, you may know most, the, most uh, countries, that's the most popular brands, things like Marlboro and, and Camel, but there's almost none of that sold in Canada. It's all, almost all vir Virginia. And part of the implication of that is that there's very little of what we would normally consider additives. There's no ammoniated tobacco or um, you know, uh, chocolate and those things. It, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're generally the, the cigarettes that are advertised here as additive free, um, even though it's not entirely true. Um, part of that is a historical accident uh, where uh, the Marlboro brand name is not actually owned by Philip Morris in Canada. So we have Marlboro cigarettes, but they're just, a, they're just there to hold the brand name rather than actual, they're not, they, they look very different. Um, and the, another s difference is the actual menthol smokers themselves. Uh, when we did our survey of menthol smokers that we found, um, about 5% of overall menthol sales are, 5% um, uh, 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 of tobacco sales are menthol cigarettes. Uh, but about 25, 27% of, of smokers have at least tried some menthol in the past year, either occasionally or when they're sick or so forth. Um, they were likely to be a little bit younger than our, our other sample of just smokers, and they were less likely to be white. But in, again, just to note that by less likely to be white, it means that 77% of menthol smokers were white. So this is, a, a, an, again, an important distinction that the, the sort of the racial issues in, involved in menthol in the States aren't as present here. Uh, they were likely to be more experimental, so they had tried um, e more e-cigarettes, other flavored tobacco products, other unflavored tobacco products compared to other smokers. And finally, the, the other key contextual thing is that awareness of this ban was very low. There was almost no political controversy about the implementation of the menthol ban at all. And so not even smokers were aware that it had come in. It wasn't a big issue, it wasn't in the news. Um, and uh, even a few months before, only 40% of menthol users knew that uh, menthol was going to be taken off the shelf, um, and only 25% of non-menthol smokers. So this was, uh, it, it, and then I think that lack of controversy also led to a lack of sort of knowledge about the bans or education about the ban itself. And so we saw fairly low levels of support for it. Um, obviously ranging from uh, daily users only had 16% support for the ban before it was implemented, up to 40% for those who never used menthol at all. Can I ask a question? 
Sure. But, um, is that because of uh, the lobbying effort uh, in Canada? Are they not as strong as they are in the U.S.? Because, I mean, something like this here would have been in the news for months ahead of time with a huge uh, <laughs> we, we kept support base. We kept waiting for the shoe to drop. It was, it was really interesting. It just just passed by, and, and even now, even after the implementation, there has been almost not a peep. So there's, there is a huge campaign by the uh, tobacco companies currently over the implementation of uh, plain packaging, which is legislation that's about to be on the books. And so there are Facebook ads, and there's huge, they're always in, in, in government offices, and uh, there are sort of pseudo grassroots groups. But it's all about uh, plain packaging, and there's there is uh, um, just almost again. I mean, there continues to be low awareness of the ban after the ban has been implemented. Uh, it just it just never hit. And I, I, again, I, I don't know if that's about the particularities of Ontario or, um, but we saw the same thing in in, in Alberta and Nova Scotia and uh, Quebec is slightly different. Um, but uh, they're, they're just, there's been no legal challenges um, other than Quebec, um, but that's probably for a different reason if we want to get into that later, uh, and more related to the other flavorings. So uh, before the ban, um, the prediction was that they would not be affected very much for most people, uh, that uh, smokers suggested that about two-thirds of them would continue just to smoke or switch to non-menthol cigarettes only. Um, about 13% would su suggested that they might quit, and other uh, numbers of buy contraband or switch to other flavor products or, or didn't know. The our previous study um, with led by uh, this that one was led by Joanna Cohen um, out of John Hopkins had looked at the implementation. Um, again, uh, particularly of the uh, PACs, we didn't get in time to look at uh, human behavior, um, and found uh, that Rothman, Benson, Hedges, who are the Philip Morris subsidiary in Canada, um, had introduced a number of uh, menthol replacement products, the, the essentially green products, so that uh, they're, they're this example here is advertising to the convenience store owners um, where you've basically scratch off menthol and you put green on. Um, our, our sort of basic preliminary analysis of, of the, the tobacco themselves suggests that there was no menthol in the replacement product. Uh, we don't know if there's anything else in, the, in those, but uh, um, it looked primarily a marketing issue. And in, in Ontario, we, we also saw some of this happen, that we did get some green uh, menthol replacement packs. This was, a, this is next a menthol, uh, next pri it used to be menthol, it is now next uh, green. And uh, so same idea. But what we saw that was different in Ontario, that there actually was a, a, a very different response. The, the tobacco company had uh, about a year and a half to prepare um, for this ban compared to only a few months for Alberta and almost no time for Nova Scotia. In Nova Scotia, we saw no, there were no replacement packs at all. In Alberta, we saw um, a handful, uh, basically out of one company. In, in Ontario, though, what they did that was very different is they introduced these capsule cigarettes. So capsule cigarettes are, were a, an entirely new product for the Canadian market. Uh, they had existed in other, do exist in other countries and had existed in uh, the States, for instance. There was a, um, there are some issues over uh, Camel Crush was the, 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 the popular flavor and it, it was more than menthol, it was sort of other, lots of different flavors of, of, of tobacco and candy f and so forth. And that was uh, a qu very, very quickly regulated. But that was a number of years ago, but those cigarettes never made it to Canada. And they weren't, in they weren't brought to, to Alberta and they weren't brought to Nova Scotia. The only place they were brought in was Ontario and only after the announcement of the, uh, of the, of the, that the ban was coming in. So this was a new product category that, uh, that had come in knowing that tobacco companies had brought in, knowing that they were going to have to remove them from the shelves in less than a year. Now, so Crushables have uh, their, their little s s capsule inside the filter, and you pop it, and it releases the, the flavor. 
It's a very satisfying little pop if you ever get a chance to do it. Um, and they gave it a menthol taste. There's no other flavors that would be allowed. Um, and they were advertised on the packs themselves. So this one, you could see it says uh, um, the, this, this two in one, and this, this is the company symbol for their crushable. Um, and you can choose between smooth taste, that is the normal cigarette, or fresh taste, that is the, the menthol taste. And I just want to point that out, that in this advertising, they oppose the idea of smooth and fresh, where smooth is not the menthol, but fresh is. And that's consistent with the branding of these capsules, is that they're, 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 they're called things like boost and charge and um, you know, crush. They're very strong, and they, add, they talk about adding intensity um, and versus the sort of the smooth, uh, uh, unmentholated cigarette. They did, some of these do come in green. This is an example of a green, but most of them, in fact, were blue. And there were, in fact, a number of cigarettes that had both blue and green capsules. So you could choose to do, you get your green menthol or your blue menthol or both of them at the same time if you, if you wanted to. Um, and of course, there was a lot of focus on choice and choose and uh, you know, decision making in the hands of the smoker. So here's, this is on the cigarette pack itself. It says, boost your menthol taste, it's your choice. Um, and there was uh, uh, much of that type of in, in, um, messaging. So again, this is a segment that had not existed prior to the, to the announcement of the ban. It was heavily marketed to the extent that is possible in Ontario, um, both directly to the retailers primarily, and also uh, they would do uh, discounting. And you, c you have black and white signs that say capsules, you know, uh, $9 or whatever it would be. And, uh, and it was relatively successful that even with all these limitations on advertising, over 20% of menthol smokers had switched to capsule cigarettes by the time um, within, a, within a year. So why capsules? Uh, on the, the on-the-ground thinking before the ban actually went into place was that this was a loophole. The wording of the Ontario law is a bit ambiguous. And it was thought that the tobacco companies might have found a way of saying, well, the menthol, these capsules aren't, you know, the menthol's not in the tobacco, so, you know, it's, uh, this, this wouldn't count. Or they would sell the, the capsules separately from the actual cigarettes, and you could just add them. That turned out not to be the case. They, they have removed the capsules from the market. The second idea is that this was uh, uh, this focus on choice was to uh, how to increase the sort of the anger over the ban. So the idea that the tobacco companies are offering you choice, but the government is taking your choices away. Um, and uh, if if that was their intent, it's been incredibly unsuccessful. Uh, but it's certainly possible that was part of the idea. And the third hypothesis, I think, which is worth exploring further, is the idea that this was trying to wean smokers off of menthol, uh, it particularly the, the, the ones who use menthol regularly, and to give them a sense that they didn't only have to smoke menthol, or that it could be a sort of a, a part of the experience rather than the whole experience. In general, the industry response in terms of the packaging and the new packs was, uh, was extensive, and much more extensive than it was in Alberta or Nova Scotia. Uh, the, the, and they explicitly suggested the replacements prior to ban. This is a, 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 a pack that was purchased before the ban was put into place. And it, it says, your new smooth-tasting non-menthol alternative. Um, it, you know that it's blue, not green. And the, the, uh, the brand name for this one is actually called Unison. Um, and it is a replacement for a number of different brands. And so each company actually put out uh, some marketing stuff about which brands smokers should, should switch to. So this is the uh, RBH, which is the Philip Morris. And so this has, uh, you, you go and you choose your, your brand, you flip to it, and it tells you if you uh, smoke Benson & Hedges Menthol or Benson & Hedges Deluxe, you should switch to Unison. Um, and they would also helpfully do it for uh, competing brands, so for, uh, you know, Pall Mall, uh, which is a, a BAT brand in Canada, you're supposed to switch to this next green. Um, 
And there was a, you know, so BAT had their version. So their version looked like this. It was a very pretty wheel. Um, also providing some advertising, telling people that uh, uh, menthol was, a menthol band was coming into place. And so you select your, um, you select your brand. So let's say, you know, uh, Vogue uh, Turquoise. Um, and you switch to Vogue Rouge, which uh, with its uh, low order reducing uh, technologies. Um, and uh, so for each brand, they had its own, uh, its, 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 its comparison. And, and there were fewer replacement brands than there were menthol brands before. So there's a condensing of, of, uh, of cigarettes here. It's also interesting that for, for that some of the replacement brands were actually regular cigarettes. So for number seven, for instance, which is a, a, a competitor's brand, uh, they suggested switching to John Player's Rich, which is a standard cigarettes, one of the more popular brands. Um, it's one of the best, it's sort of a standard uh, tobacco. Um, and uh, yeah, and so they had this very complicated setup. They did also have some new product categories and sort of other, other innovations, let's call them. Uh, so this is advertising for the retailer. Um, and this is switching from a John Player Charge, which was, of course, a, a convertible, to John Player Choice. And the interesting thing about Choice is it is an adjustable filter. Um, and so you can turn this filter. And it says freedom of choice here. And if we look at uh, the, the pack itself, this is the back of the pack, and it tells you how to use it. Um, and so it, it says that you twist the filter to choose your taste intensity. So instead of pressing the button uh, to, to increase the intensity, you twist the filter and you get more intense uh, deliveries probably of something. It gives you, it gives you more intensity uh, and by, uh, by having this, this twistable filter um, that uh, I don't know if it's, it's, it's kind of a neat, yeah. <laughs> You've got, a, you've got a you've got a couple. I think it must open up something, uh, so that the, you basically I'd I'd suggest that the, probably the ventilation changes or or something along those lines. Um, it it works very smoothly. So I mean it, it's you know there's clearly not ball bearings or something inside of it. So I. Uh, yeah, I, it, I think it's. It was, uh, I'm interested to see, and if and it has it's a, on a gradient as well, so you could choose any level on the step, but I don't know. It's probably open or shut. I suspect. So I. Yeah, that, uh, the, the other novel product is, uh, is it's called Aqua, uh, Camel North Aqua Filter. And this is a capsule uh, cigarette, uh, but it's a non-menthol capsule. Um, and so this is the instructions for it, where you, uh, you, you see this is the inside, you can see through it. You crush that capsule, you wait three seconds, and uh, whatever the liquid, it looks like kind of a saline type solution, it doesn't smell. Um, uh, pools and you get some sort of aqua filter, whatever that does. I, I don't know. It might just be, you know, be able to press a button or something. Is, is that uh, uh, also curious to find out if that had, uh, what that does, if it does anything at all. There's no menthol. Yeah. yeah. It may just be water, though. And it, it may just be a bit of a scam, right? It, so that is one possibility of it, that you're, you're, they've gotten used to crushing something. And so here, you crush something, and it's, it's water. And uh, you, you, it feels like an innovation. It's you know, like a charcoal filter uh, kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing something about, about your smoking, like the same way that people think that water filters hook a smoke. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure. Or there's something else in it. Like, there certainly could be uh, something else in it. Um, but, uh, it, you know, that's, that's we're hoping you guys can find out. Yes. So, th this, 
process of, of, of matching and of replacement, again, this much more complicated process, suggests to me anyways that there are different clusters of menthol users in the market. And one such cluster are those who may be, it seems like are those who are using menthol to mask or soothe uh, the people who use it when they're sick, for instance, the people who find cigarettes too harsh. The ones, a number of cigarette brands call the menthol their new smooth uh, alternative, right? So they're looking for smooth out of their menthol. There are also people who are looking for not smooth out of their menthol, the intensity, looking for something else, something, uh, you know, a boost from their menthol. And it, it seems to me that those are different uh, categories. There also seems to be a social awareness type of category, the, the low order, the people who are using menthol because it doesn't smell as much. Um, and it may not make them smell as much. And there, there, there may be others. Uh, again, this is some of which may be marketing and some of which may be more pharmacological. And uh, again, we're, this is where we hope to turn to you to, to, to find some of this out. In terms of the human behavior, though, uh, what we found is uh, sort of a mixed bag in terms of responses. And this is quite early on in, in, in the ban. This was only a month after the implementation. And we had found that 33% had smoked a menthol cigarette after the ban had gone into place. Um, most of those people were those who had smoked, 64% of those who had smoked regularly um, had smoked a menthol after the implementation of the ban. A little bit lower numbers had tried to obtain um, uh, uh, menthol cigarettes, uh, but very few of them were unsuccessful at obtaining them if they tried. So only 13% of those 25 were unsuccessful, at, 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 were actually stopped at the store and they decided not to go get any more. Um, so the, uh, the, 30 th the difference between these numbers is probably is uh, uh, stockpiling and or just you had your, 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 your cigarettes already. Um, and again, because it, the time period is very short here. The me main method of obtaining uh, menthol after the ban was from purchasing from First Nations uh, territories. Um, in Ontario, there are many, there's, it's a fairly, it's a very large industry, um, First Nations uh, tobacco sales. Uh, and uh, the, the standard tobacco industry suggests that 50% uh, of cigarettes sold in Ontario are uh, from First Nations. That is probably not true. It's probably more like 10 to 15%, uh, but it's substantial. And actually this 36% of 25% suggests that the, the number of, of these contraband menthol smokers is right in that range of 10 to 15%. So it, it's a fairly high number, but it is sort of consistent with what's available of regular cigarettes. 34% uh, were able to purchase menthol at stores after the ban. Um, when we went out to do our after purchase uh, a few months later, uh, it, three months after the ban, uh, that we couldn't find any. So uh, it, it, it shut down fairly quickly. So it might, like, there was clearly a little bit of leeway, um, and then that closed down. Uh, very few people uh, got products from um, other countries, provinces, or online. One thing that people did do was that they, uh, for, was the use of other alternative flavored products. This in, includes uh, e-cigarettes in this category. And we see a, a difference here between those who use menthol occasionally versus those who use, use daily. Before the ban, uh, daily smokers were less likely to use um, uh, other products on a regular basis. And afterwards, they were, uh, again, in a month afterwards, uh, their, their use increases uh, quite substantially. Okay. We'll t uh, take a look at it. it, it I think it, it's a variety. There are, um, the, the, it, it, is, it, uh, it seems to be pretty spread out between different products. Uh, so there were e-cigarette users and there were um, uh, a cigar uh, flavored users as well. Again, as part of the, uh, the there, there was actually an, uh, um, the, the change in the law on flavored cigars also created new segmentation in terms of uh, the flavor market and different advertising campaigns for them. So they, they, uh, there was a, a, a general change in use of, of, of flavored cigars that was uh, a really big unintended consequence of the, the, the entire law. I think not totally related to the menthol. Um, the other 
uh, thing that happened was that there was a large amount of quitting behavior that went on. So 42% had made a quit attempt since the ban, um, which, which is a huge number. Uh, probably contextualized the fact that this happened over New Year's, though. So uh, that, uh, that there's, there's likely some uh, of, of that going on. And there was no difference in quitting uh, rates between uh, the, those who use menthol rarely versus those who use daily. However, there was a difference in the attribution of those quit attempts. So 75% of people who used uh, menthol daily said their quit attempt was associated with uh, the, the ban versus a substantial number of those who used it on a rare basis. It did seem to be whatever that it, lack of availability had some impact. Uh, we didn't follow up non-menthol smokers. So this is the, the comparison here is between um, uh, so the, those who use infrequently versus frequently, essentially. Uh, we should, and again, th as we saw with, with the alternative tobacco products, uh, that we saw that difference where we didn't see it here. Um, whether or not that those people were different in other ways, we, can't, we weren't able to adjust for. That's, I mean, it's an interesting question about this sort of the, uh, not in large numbers, not in large numbers. Um, they, uh, no, the, the, the primary response was, was quitting. People did some in other interesting things in terms of their responses um, that they, uh, they added uh, the mint or menthol flavor manually. So this, uh, this product is one that, that sort of came onto the markets recently. It uh, was actually brought in, imported from North Carolina by one of the, the major cigars um, uh, companies. <coughs> and uh, it may not be fully targeted to tobacco here. I think if you read this language, it is not tobacco-associated language. Um, but it, it is sold next to tobacco, and they was recommended by some store owners as a, a, a tobacco-related. And some people did say specifically that their way of dealing with the menthol ban was to switch to marijuana smoking. So uh, that, that there weren't huge numbers of people who, who did either of these things, uh, but it, it existed. Could you opt out to like roll your own tobacco? Y yeah, you, you can roll your own or you can put it, so it's a card. Um, and you take the card and you, you can put it into the roll your own. That's probably the most effective. Uh, but you can, you can add it to your tobacco pack. I mean, it's often the way that they add menthol cigarettes. It's not added often to the mm -hmm. cigarette, right? It's added to the foil. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is a sort of a similar way of, of, of doing it. Um, it just, you, you do it yourself. There are also drops you can add um, at, at different ways. I mean, people try their own things. I mean, some people said they, were, they, they brushed their teeth first and then smoked, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> maybe not quite as effective. <laughs> There, there are more, so we saw with, with, with the overall flavor ban, there were other things that were going on too. So like hookah, for instance, you weren't allowed to flavor anymore. So uh, the, the way of selling hookah was you sold a tub of the hookah tobacco and then a tub of your flavor of choice. It, was like, it looked like a large syrup um, and you would, you know, you'd add them and mix them up, um, which more similar to the roll your own style. So uh, we yeah, so there were uh, uh, other things. But again, these were relatively rare, and actually people used them less than they predicted they would. So m there were more people that, who predicted they would turn to alternatives um, uh, than actually did. And when we asked them at the follow-up what they were going to do long-term, now that this ban was actually in place, what was their predicted long-term behavior? The, the correlation between uh, that and their predicted before beha band behavior was very low. I think a cap of like 0.2 or something. Um, and uh, the, the, some of the big changes that they were actually more likely to try to quit than predicted, um, uh, that were predicted previously. Um, and we can see that. So already there were 15% who were abstinent by the time we, uh, we followed them up a month later, compared to only 13% who said that they would quit, who tried to quit. Um, at the uh, before the ban was in place, they were also 
interestingly less likely to predict to use alternative forms of flavor replacements uh, in terms of e-tobacco or e-cigarettes in the long term. So the, although we saw the uptake of those alternative products, it seems like they were not satisfying or that they didn't replace in the way that they wanted to. Uh, we saw, uh, we haven't looked into the data too much, but those are the comments that we're getting on the menthol cigarettes are also in a similar vein. They're just disappointed. Um, and they, they, uh, the study that we're doing with Eric um, Sol, who does concept mapping, um, is just that there's a lot of sort of sadness. <laughs> you know, I miss my menthol kind of feeling. And, it, and, it, the, and, and that, that hole is not, is, not, is not being replaced by other products, although there is clearly the attempt to do so. So in, in conclusion then, the menthol ban in Ontario suggests that there is a, a it was a highly feasible thing to do. Uh, it was implemented with minimal political or social controversy. Uh, the industry response suggests that the menthol users, at least in Ontario, are not a, a homogeneous group, that there are differences in why people are using menthol perhaps and uh, you know maybe just in terms of the branding but perhaps also in terms of the pharmacology and both of those are I think important to look at. The early responses of smokers suggest that they do try and quit uh, and do try and quit more than they predicted they would um, so that's a, a key point and the alternatives uh, are tried but don't seem to be working in the way that they want them to. So we will continue to follow up these menthol smokers and, uh, um, and we will look at uh, uh, the long-term effects of this ban. But uh, that's the, uh, the conclusion of, of, of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>